BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Node 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday. Time for the AMA. That is the Ask Me Anything. Welcome to the show. And this is the day where I'm going to respond to your questions and comments. We're going to go through the material together and have a discussion. But first, just a couple of quick announcements. The first one is that you can always download the audio of this program for free at Launchpad 1. That's like the audio version as a pure podcast. Take it on the go anywhere and anyhow. If you would like to download the video version, you can use YouTube Premium, but you have to pay for that one. Launchpad 1 is completely free. It's under the same name, Black Box Online Radio, but the easiest way to find it is just to go into the description box and click the link. In addition to that, another great way of supporting the show is to visit Amazon.com and look at the book Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned DeHaan. It is a novel, murder mystery... It's fiction, but still feel free to have a look at that if you're curious about that. If you're a big fan of murder mysteries, I invite you to check it out. And, of course, there is always the Teespring page. You can have a look at some of the merchandise, t-shirts, coffee mugs, and remember, being weird is not a crime. I am also the host of the program Astro Psych 400. It's more of a video series than a program. I did 12 videos on the star signs, like the zodiac signs, talking about the zodiac killer a lot, got me curious about astrology, so I created the channel Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and I would just invite you to have a look at that, that is also completely free of course, as are many things here on YouTube, but the last thing I would say is, I'm going to be doing the regularly scheduled announcement episode about the disappearance of Donna Lass, this Thursday, that's going to be coming out tomorrow, and then on Friday, I'm going to be doing something about Jack the Ripper, so you Ripperologists out there, I would love if you tuned in, because I'm not an expert on the Ripper, and I always like different types of insight, I appreciate different perspectives, what other people have to say, that's why I do this Wednesday AMA in the first place, because I love interacting with you guys, but it is now the month of August, and I wanted to do a series of episodes covering the murders that are connected to Jack the Ripper throughout the summer and the fall. And there's going to be one that's going to start all of that this Friday for the Anything Goes segment. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, now is a great time to do that. Hit the like button, subscribe button, notification bell, all of that stuff. And while I'm going to be devoting the majority of this episode to your Zodiac Killer questions... I often begin these AMAs with a borrowed question, and this one comes from the channel Oak Leaves and Onions. I've talked a lot about this channel recently. As I said, it's not really life coaching, it's more or less just stories of personal experience. But on that channel, the host was doing a q and I'm not, I don't even know her name, but I think she does it anonymously. She was um, doing a Q&A session, and somebody wrote in, and he said this, Every time... I get online, and I try to talk to women. It's like throwing a ping-pong ping-pong ball. Wow, that was a hard thing to say. It's like throwing a ping-pong ball against the wall. Yeah, there's a reason why that sentence tripped me up a little bit. He said, it's like I'm always carrying the conversation. I end up asking women lots of questions, and they just give me simple one-word answers. What am I doing wrong? And I'm fully aware that he's not listening to this. This is a borrowed question from somebody else's channel. But the reason why I wanted to respond to it was, I really didn't like the host's answer too much when she said, well, you need to choose more interesting conversation topics. You need to choose more exciting conversation topics. Go beyond pleasantries. Talk about rock climbing or adventure sports or something like that. And I really did not like the answer. Think about what this guy said. Ping pong ball against the wall. There, I said it right that time. 
In short, he's saying that he's trying to interact with people on the internet, and he's asking them questions. Hi, hey, how's the weather where you are? And she's just saying, it's sunny. What's the problem? The problem is, this guy hasn't isolated what he wants. He hasn't identified what he wants. And what do you think he wants? Does he want, like, a relationship? Does he want sex? Does he want a friend with benefits? And you might be thinking, well, all of the above. I mean, if he's on dating sites talking to girls. Yeah, but that's all secondary. First and foremost, this guy wanted empathy. That's right, empathy. The whole reason why he's writing out that question is he is not getting this type of humane response. He feels that the people that he's talking to online are not acknowledging how he feels, and they aren't respecting how he feels. And that's the hard realization that a lot of us have to make. At a certain point, you just have to accept that you're not going to be friends with everyone. You're not going to get along with everyone, and not everyone is going to want to have an extended conversation with you, or even leading to something more than that, because I'm sure he's interested in relationships, and that's why he asked the question. But at that point, you just got to say, hey, you're being disrespectful. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Walk away. If he's trying to engage with people and they're just monopolizing his time or they're just using him for attention, and let's not pretend like that isn't what's happening. If he's always carrying the conversation and if he's always just asking questions and people are giving one word answers and they're not asking him how he's doing, they're monopolizing his time. They're just using him for attention. And it's a, it's a form of power dripping. It's a very basic manipulation tactic where one person knows that the other desires something from them. So they're just going to keep being bland and um, responsive enough just to hold on to that person. But then as soon as um, that person gets mad, they're going to say, oh, look at what he's become. So that's why I would say recognize that that person's not being disrespectful. That person is not being respectful. They are being disrespectful. Walk away. If someone isn't making an honest attempt to converse with you, you don't have to talk to them. That's the whole point of, like, dating sites. Or there are also friendships like, like Interpals and Meet Me. You can talk to somebody else. Just You don't even have to say goodbye. Just move on and uh, really identify that that's what you're truly after in that situation. Empathy. Fairness and empathy. Okay, now let's talk about some of your Zodiac Killer questions here. The first one is going to come to us from Avery Henley, who says, Do you think the Zodiac Killer case will finally be solved one day? Avery, thank you for the question. My short answer is yes, I do. My extended answer is, on Monday for the Zodiac Monday segment, I was talking about Arthur Lee Allen and the murder of Carolyn Eaton from 1982. Carolyn Eaton was known as Valentine Sally for many years, and then through having her body exhumed and DNA testing, they identified her as Carolyn Eaton. And I was talking about a missing persons case, or not really a missing persons case, but um, a Jane Doe story that I had learned about as a kid watching America's Most Wanted, the story of J Daisy Jane Doe, also known as Daisy Doe. And I decided to just read up after that episode. Did they ever identify Daisy Jane Doe? And they did. Her name is Jeanette Coleman. And um, there's actually quite a big story behind that that I might talk about next week on True Crime Talk Radio. But they've identified her, Marcia King, the buckskin girl, whom she was known as the buckskin girl or buckskin doe for many years, was also identified through new forensic measures. They caught the Golden State Killer. The Zodiac's 340 cipher has been cracked. The Bates had to die letters in the Sherry Joe Bates mystery have been identified to be a hoax and determined to be a hoax. Yes, I believe that the Zodiac Killer mystery will be solved one day because the advances in forensic sciences are coming at us so quickly, so fast. Forensic science is improving beyond our wildest imagination. So I do think that we're going to get definitive answers. We might not know everything. And the conspiracy theorists out there will always challenge the findings. They're going to be like, wait a second, no, the science is wrong for this reason or that reason. Let them do it. Let's talk about it later. We'll cross that bridge once we come to it. But yes, I do believe that 
the Zodiac Killer mystery will be solved, and I think we will know a lot more in the next five to ten years. I mean, a lot. Maybe the majority of questions about the Zodiac Killer mystery. Our next comment comes to us from Zurab Sheila, who had something to say about the episode Arthur Lee Allen Debunked, which came out last weekend. Thank you to everybody who watched the debunking series on the Zodiac. It's still uh, ongoing. There will be new episodes out this weekend. As I said, you can always like and subscribe. But Zurab Sheila's question is, was Arthur Lee Allen bald in 1969? And you know what? I didn't even look up a photo of Arthur Lee Allen in 1969. I thought about that for one second, and then I was like, yes, he was. Balding, to be precise. That's the way that Robert Graysmith established the narrative around Arthur Lee Allen in his writings about the Zodiac Killer. Graysmith talked about this extensively in Zodiac Unmasked when he said that he believed that the motivation for Arthur Lee Allen to be the Zodiac Killer was restoring a broken ego and self-image. He portrayed Arthur Lee Allen as someone who at one time was a very good athlete, mostly an accomplished diver, but also he was very good at trampoline gymnastics. And then he got kicked out of the Navy, he gained a bunch of weight, and he lost his hair. So he had this shattered ego and shattered self-image, and he wanted to respond to that in a destructive way by becoming the Zodiac Killer. And that's also one of the reasons why Robert Graysmith speculated that the Zodiac was wearing wigs when he committed crimes. Even at the Lake Berryessa stabbing on September 27th of 1969, he said that he thought that Arthur Lee Allen was wearing a wig underneath the Zodiac Killer costume. Now, I hope I get everything right in this next person's name. ADC two zero zero three two nine six six. I hope I hope I didn't miss any digits, but he or she, you, ADC. I'm just going to call you ADC, okay? ADC has a question about that exact subject. Why wear a wig under that hood at Lake Berryessa? Why would somebody wear a wig under the Lake Berryessa costume? It's utterly ridiculous. I absolutely do not believe that Arthur Lee Allen was the Zodiac Killer. As I said in that debunking episode, that he was the full package, that he wrote all the letters, he committed all the murders, he made the phone calls. I don't believe that. I also don't believe the Zodiac Killer was wearing a wig at Lake Berryessa underneath the hooded costume, because there's no reason to do that. If you're going to be putting on a mask that covers the entirety of your head, a hooded mask costume, you don't need to wear a wig. I'm, the reason why I think Graysmith said that was he was fudging the facts to make his suspect work. Because even though the authorities heavily looked into Arthur Lee Allen, and he was practically their prime suspect, we can even say that he was their prime suspect, that doesn't mean that Graysmith had to agree with them Instead, Graysmith, in his own writings, decided to fudge the narrative to make it work around his suspect, Arthur Lee Allen. And aside from that, the book Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer by Drew Beeson talks about this a lot when he says, It's purely impractical for anybody to have been wearing a, a, a wig underneath that Lake Berryessa hood. What if Brian Hartnell had fought back? That person's vision could have been impaired so easily just by the wig falling down a little bit. It would completely, completely render them useless. It would put them in a vulnerable place. It's an added vulnerability that doesn't need to be there, especially if you're intending to kill the people. They're not expecting to have any witness descriptions at all. Now, I do think the perpetrator at Lake Berryessa went through an enormous amount of effort to hide his appearance, and it's not only the hooded costume, it's also the addition of the clip-on sunglasses that are seen on that Zodiac hood to hide the eyes, maybe just trying to hide any type of physical feature. But also, underneath the Lake Berryessa hood, the perpetrator was wearing either a dark blue or a black windbreaker, and I would cite Zodiac Just the Facts where I read this, and um, I have a four-part series on the response to those police reports in Zodiac, just the facts, the ones that Tom Voigt assembled. But the Zodiac was trying to hide his appearance, and I can get where someone is saying that, okay, he's trying to put on this hooded costume because he doesn't want to be seen in the daylight, and even if 
someone sees him from like across the lake or something like that, they're going to see this hooded figure wearing a dark blue or dark black windbreaker. Then he's going to hide behind a tree after he's committed the murder and he's going to remove the costume. And then his witness description is going to change completely. Yeah, okay, the guy's putting in a lot of effort to hide his appearance. That doesn't mean that he was wearing a wig. It's ridiculous. Our next comment comes to us from NPC Porky, who says, Something new. This channel makes videos about the Zodiac, and the channel owner presents a new sp suspect in this video. Unfortunately, he does not provide much info, but claims he will provide more in the future. Maybe you can ask him for more info about his suspect. And thank you to NPC Porky. I did watch the video... And this channel is named Nancy Drew, that's just the name of it, it's hosted by a guy, and he proposed a new Zodiac suspect named John L. Johnson. I hope that I got that right. John Johnson, but it's John L. Johnson, maybe that'd be a way we can differentiate him from all the other John Johnsons out there. And the way he did this was just learning about the geographic profiling of the area, I don't know who this guy is, but he says he's not using any of the documentaries or major sources. He wanted to identify why people are putting forward this theory that the Zodiac is somebody who flew under the radar. Somebody committed a series of murders in 1968 and 69 and then began writing in letters and creating ciphers and cryptograms taking credit for it. But if we're going to look for a suspect that flew under the radar, we have to start looking in some different places. Uh, the new the new suspect, McDuff, that was talked about a lot earlier this year is a good example of that. But this guy has proposed one named John L. Johnson, and I'm not even going to share a photo of him yet. But one more time, the name of his channel is Nancy Drew. And from what I recall from his video, it says that he believes this guy was a custodian who worked at the high school. I, he was a graduate of Hogan High School, but... He may have worked at um, another high school nearby, and that's how he learns about these victims. And he's targeting Lover's Lane, someone who is frustrated with life. The video that NPC Porky shared with me is called Unsolved, Episode 52, Zodiac Killer Case, Our First Suspect. So, um, big thank you to Nancy Drew, and thank you to NPC Porky. NPC Porky also left another question saying, um, this is off topic, but... Do you watch the channel Criminally Listed? And my answer is, I did in the past. I subscribed to Criminally Listed when the channel was brand new, and I believe it's still one guy that does everything. He presents it like it's a team of people who are working on it, but I watched a lot of those videos in the past, and I was always so impressed about how good he was at attracting a following, just saying something like, three missing persons cases. Yet so many people want to tune in, like, I want to find out what those three cases are. He's very good at um, getting your attention. Now, ADC has left another comment on the recent episode, Arthur Lee Allen and the Murder of Valentine Sally. As I said, Carolyn Eaton was murdered on or about February 4th, 1982. Her remains were discovered February 14th of that same year. And because she was discovered on Valentine's Day, the authorities gave her the name Valentine Sally. And she was known as that just as a pseudonym, as a as an alternative to Jane Doe for many years. DNA has since revealed that she is Carolyn Eaton, or she was, rather, rest in peace. But on that episode, ADC had a question about the last person to see Carolyn Eaton, a.k.a. Valentine Sally, alive. And this um, person is named Patty Wilkins, and she identified that man as Arthur Lee Allen after looking at a photo of him. ADC asked the question, if somebody knows a person is a suspected killer, they'd be more likely to pick out their their face, I guess. Did everyone know ALA's face by then? ALA, of course, referring to Arthur Lee Allen. Arthur Lee Allen is not only a suspect in the Zodiac Killer mystery, but also a suspect in the murder of Carolyn Eaton, mostly because of this channel called ZNN Zodiac News Network. What I can share with you is they sat down with this person who spent about an hour with Carolyn Eaton and said alleged perpetrator, and she identified him. They're asking her these questions. Hey, did you know who Arthur Lee Allen was prior to this? And she said no. I mean, it seems a little bit fishy. You'd think that 
she must have known something, but she says she's never heard of Arthur Lee Allen before, that she didn't n see that photo anywhere of him. I believe they showed her the one where he has that little goatee beard, so to speak. She says that um, that's the man who was with Carolyn Eaton, and that's the last sighting of her right before she was murdered. And one more time, the name of their channel is ZNN, Zodiac News Network. They have a video about Arthur Lee Allen and the murder of Valentine Sally. And if you like to hear a very skeptical response, you can watch the one here on this channel, Black Box Online Radio. And I think um, Classic Chevy Cat also pointed out that those are the guys who say, oh, I just remembered one of their names. I think one of them is named Jethro or something like that. And the other is Professor something something. They're, they're very wacky. Because Classic Chevy Cat pointed out, they're the guys who say that they believe the Zodiac Killer tattooed images on the teeth of victims. Ridiculous. Nonsense. Hogwash. Baloney. Absolutely not. The Zodiac did almost nothing to the victims post-mortem. From Lake Herman Road all the way to the Stein murder, and really the murder of Paul Stein on October 11th of 69, it's one of the few times when the Zodiac Killer is actually moving the body of the victim at all. But um, Classic Chevy Cat has another comment that I wanted to get to, and it was on the most recent True Crime Talk Radio episode. And True Crime Talk Radio comes out on Tuesdays. It's like a bonus episode in addition to the regular content that is listed here, like Zodiac Mondays, the AMA, and the Anything Goes Friday segment. Classic Chevy Cat writes, after listening, I was thinking, what definitive proof do they have that the Zodiac was working alone? Is it possible that there could have been a gang of murderers? Okay, two questions already. Question number one. I don't think anyone has any proof that the Zodiac was working alone. I mean, it's an unsolved mystery. Is it possible that there could have been a gang of murderers? Absolutely. And one of the prime suspects in the multiple killers theory is the Ott Brothers gang meaning that there was an informant named David Walliott. By informant, I mean he was a local drug dealer and probably not a very high-ranking criminal, but he thought he was, and he was acting as a confidential informant and an active informant for the police departments where people come, they buy drugs from him, and then later on that person gets arrested. It's like a variant of a sting operation, except he is a real drug dealer, and he is a real criminal. He just has immunity, and so on. And he is a suspect in the Lake Herman Road murders that saw the deaths of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. And a criminal that could be connected to him is named Donald Warren Porter, who may have been the shooter at Blue Rock Springs. So it's like what I guess we can call the Ott Brothers gang is a suspect, and that's mostly talked about in the hoax theory, which is put forward by Thomas Henry Horn. But I don't think that everyone is in agreement that that is even in high regard. And when I share that, I'm saying that the vast majority of people who look into the Zodiac Killer mystery think there was a single perpetrator, and then you have variants of the multiple killer series. Some people think it was a partnership, that there were two guys, and some people think there were four guys. Let's um, let's keep going in Chevy Cat's comment. You have the four crime scenes, Lake Herman Road, no witnesses, Blue Rock Springs, you have one witness who wasn't very clear. Uh, Mike Michaud reported after the Blue Rock Springs shooting on July 4th of 1969 that he couldn't make out any features of the Zodiac Killer. He, the only thing he said was his face was very big. Lake Berryessa, he was wearing a mask. Witnesses could give an estimated height, weight, and vocal tone. Okay, then in San Francisco, you have the kids across the street and possibly visual by two officers. There were different people who spoke to the alleged assailant. No way to compare. I'm not saying I believe there was more than one perpetrator. However, there sure is a good argument that there could have been. Maybe as many as four different men working together. Let's hear a rebuttal. I'm playing devil's advocate. Okay, you want to hear a rebuttal to the multiple killers theory? One person could have committed all the crimes. One person is present at the Stein shooting that you just described. One person is present at Lake Berryessa. One person... Um, was present at Blue Rock Springs. And not only that, there's only one set of footprints that had been tracked from the crime scene at Lake Berea. So where Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard are seated on that picnic blanket, someone committed the Lake Berea stabbing, walks to Brian Hartnell's Carmen Gia and writes the message on the car door listing the dates of Zodiac activity. That only requires one person. So 
it's almost as if with the multiple killers theory, you have to start making assumptions. And I'm really going to get into a lot of this stuff with Jack the Ripper about how some people will say that these are hoaxes that are created by the newspapers and the media, and they're just trying to link together unconnected murders through the pieces of writing and the phone calls. And, of course, Jack the Ripper didn't have phone calls, but... I mean, the hoax theory that is put forward by Thomas Henry Horan talks about this the most clearly, but lots of other people have written in variants of that in the comments section. They're saying that they think that someone was writing letters taking credit for murders that he didn't commit, or maybe there is a Zodiac killer, but then there's a letter writer who's his partner, and that the letter writer was only present for the four canonical crimes, and he just teamed up with a serial killer for those four crimes that someone's actually become, been committing murders as early as 1962, assumption, assumption, assumption. And also, as just because um, it says, let's hear a rebuttal, okay, the rebuttal would be that there really is no abnormality in the Zodiac Killer's height from any of the witness descriptions. The people who are not at Lake Berryessa say maybe 5'8 or 5'10 at Lake Berryessa, Cecilia Shepard described the perpetrator as six feet tall because he's wearing boots or the wing walker shoes, I mean, and he's wearing the Zodiac Killer hood, which is going to add uh, like at least an inch to his height as well as standing on uneven ground. So all of that seems consistent with one single person. Also, the other witness descriptions are talking about somewhat of a beefy built uh, man who is not um, not flabby but definitely has some bulk to him. That is also all consistent with a single perpetrator. And I know you just you wanted me to give a challenging response to that, and I really do appreciate that type of thinking. But we have another comment about the murder of Valentine, Sally, and Arthur Lee Allen. And this one is from Super Strike 9 who has something to say about um, the witness description talking about uh, the last known sighting of Valentine, Sally. I'm not a dentist. I have had a root canal before, though. Never heard of a partial root canal. During a root canal, they remove the nerve from the tooth, so I'm guessing the partial root canal is when they remove the nerve, but they haven't filled in slash built up the remaining tooth yet. One more time. Thank you, Super Strike 9. Valentine Sally was at the at this cafe at a truck stop. It's at the early a.m. hours, like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and she's present with an older gentleman who is estimated to be 60 to 65 years old, I mean, that's 10 to 15 years older than Arthur Lee Allen would have been in 1982, mind you. But also, she had this terrible toothache, and she had explained to more than one person that she had a partial root canal, and the autopsy also confirmed that. And what I believe they meant is that, yes, um, just as Super Strike 9 said, uh, they uh, removed part of, they removed the nerve, but they haven't filled up the tooth yet. And I'm not exactly sure how Patty Wilkins described it, but either she helped Carolyn Eaton put an aspirin in the gap in her tooth, or she was standing by as the older gentleman helped her do it. One of them was assisting her to put an aspirin in that gap because she had that terrible uh, toothache. So she's spending a lot of time with Carolyn Eaton and getting a very good look at the perpetrator. She's identified him as Arthur Lee Allen. I absolutely do not believe that. I, I simply think that she is mistaken. I think that it's an incorrect connection, and I um, I just don't believe that Arthur Lee Allen abducted Valentine Sally and then took her um, into a deserted part of the Arizona on a lonesome stretch of highway and dragged her to her death and such. By the way, Valentine Sally was either killed through strangulation or suffocation. Suffocation might actually be more likely because her hyoid bone was mostly intact. Our next comment comes to us from Todd Allman, who says, What are your thoughts on the Kathleen Johns incident? I think that it's the same problem with the murder of Carolyn Eaton. I will throw this out there to you and just say that the Zodiac Killer did not target lone women. Granted, Kathleen Johns was with her baby. The Zodiac did not abduct the victims. Whether it's Joan Webster, Carolyn Eaton... Kathleen Johns. The Zodiac didn't do things like that. The Zodiac was too much of a coward. The Zodiac would sneak up on people, fire some gunshots, and run away. The only time the Zodiac actually got 
real up close and personal with a living victim was at Lake Berryessa when he's wearing the hooded costume. Unless something happened in Paul Stein's taxi that we don't know about. But I do not believe that the Kathleen Johns incident is genuine zodiac activity. However, Michael Cole did give me somewhat of a run for the money on that because he points out that it happened March 22nd, 1970, right after the spring equinox. And he believes that, like, the solstice and the equinox are all very important. I've also thought that. You look at Lake Herman Road, the first confirmed incident in Zodiac activity, December 20th, 1968. It's right before the winter solstice. And, the, and after the Kathleen Johns incident, the Zodiac killer, or, excuse me, the alleged perpetrator, returned to Kathleen Johns's vehicle and set it on fire. That's the incident where um, she's driving down Route 132. Some guy is saying, hey, your wheel is wobbling. And he tries to fix it, but he's actually loosening the bolt. So when she takes off, he says, oh, it's worse than I thought. And he attempts to abduct her and her baby, but she gets away. And she lives to tell the tale. And the person that she identified as the assailant in that was none other than Lawrence Kane. And... Definitely in the future, I'm going to be doing an episode about Lawrence Kane um, on the debunking series that is going to happen on the weekends. The next question is from Simon, who says, Have you read the chapter on the Zodiac Killer in the book by John Douglas called The Cases That Haunt Us? No, I haven't, but I can look out for that one. Thank you for the recommendation. And the next comment comes to us from Jeff Cooper, who says, I want to see you do a debunking episode on Ted Kaczynski, or however you spell it. Yeah, you spell it K-A-C-Z-I-N-S-K-I. Don't worry, uh, Jeff. I also don't know how to spell Kaczynski, and I'm not even joking. Thank you, autocorrect. If I were an investigator, I would want to know how many serial killers were living in San Francisco in the late 1960s. But... As far as a debunking episode on Ted Kaczynski, I just mentioned Michael Cole and his theory about the solstices and the equinoxes. Michael Cole said something very interesting about him, and that was that he thought Ted Kaczynski was too smart to be the Zodiac Killer. He thinks the Zodiac Killer had somewhat of a high IQ, but that Ted Kaczynski, you know, this guy who goes to Harvard at age 16, gets brutally traumatized through some weird experimentation and then goes on to get an M.A. Ph.D. from the University of Michigan. But because he has such a high IQ, Michael Cole says, all right, that guy might be too intelligent to be the Zodiac Killer, and that's a strike against him. Very interpretive evidence, though. Apex Prowler has the next comment on the debunking series about Bruce Davis. Hey, Ned, LOL, Bruce is my favorite suspect. Wait for it. Wait for it. For damn near everything except Zodiac. I'm not riding with you on this. He's not the Zodiac. Oh, no, he says, I'm riding with you on this. He's not the Zodiac, of course, because it's the debunking series. No, I absolutely don't believe that Bruce Davis was the Zodiac killer. And I think that um, it is a flimsy case that has been put forward for him being so. And we have a comment and question from Greg Slocum, who says, Which of these men are capable of killing... They all seem to be involved in trolling who could kill, and that is on Zodiac Don Chaney AMA, the one about Don Chaney that I did in the past. And when he says, which of these men are capable of killing? I'm not sure if you're only referring to Don Chaney or Arthur Lee Allen. I really um don't know exactly how you mean that. I suppose they're all capable of killing, but they all seem to be involved in trolling. I think this relates to the fact that Let's let's face it, Don Chaney and Arthur Lee Allen definitely like being interviewed. They liked being interviewed, excuse me, they both have passed away. But Don Chaney is mentioned numerous times in the writings of Robert Graysmith for no reason at all. And it's terrible investigations because you just have this guy filling your head with nonsense. He's just making up these wild stories. Hey, whatever you want to hear... I'm going to say it. But um, Drew Beeson has put out somewhat of a solid case for Don Chaney being the Zodiac Killer. And you can hear more about that on his show, The Zodcast. Steve Allen has a comment on the Bruce Davis debunking video. 
saying Bruce Davis is the absolute scum of the earth. He's nowhere near smart enough to be the Zodiac. Well, a point that Howard Davis talks about in his Zodiac Manson connection is he thinks that Bruce Davis is a lot smarter than he genuinely leads on. He also thinks that Bruce Davis is a lot more menacing than he, than he leads on. He, when, if you listen to Bruce Davis in an interview, he comes across as just someone who's like, Now, what Scientology? Is that the same as them process Kurak people or the um, process synagogue or the um, temple of... Uh, What's that thing called? Oh, oh yeah, church. Is it? Is that the same thing? Like um, he comes across as someone who doesn't really understand what's going on. But a point where I do agree with Howard Davis is I think Bruce Davis understands a lot more than what he leads on. I, I just don't believe that he is as dumb as he might try and make himself out to be. And bear in mind that he's per just trying to uh get parole. That really is probably the only focus of his life after he went to prison. But that would be the scum of the earth. I mean, he was definitely was an active participant in multiple murders in the 1960s. The ones they convicted him for, I believe, were the murders of Gary Hinman and Shorty Shea, where they listed him as an active participant very clearly in the Hinman murder. I mean, he would be guilty of second-degree murder, hands down, no question. You don't even have to think twice about it for the murder of Gary Hinman, and he's spending the rest of his life in prison. Manic Eptipode has one about the Arthur Lee Allen debunking video, and it says, This one will piss off a lot of people. Hopefully you can also do one on some of the other suspects like Kane, knock up off the list, as well as the real ridiculous suspects like Dryman, Edward Edwards, Michael O'Hare, and Donald Lee Booyak. As far as Dryman goes, does he even deserve an episode? I'm debating that. Well, I could very easily do a debunking episode on Frank Dryman Valentine. His name was Frank Dryman. Frank uh, Valentine was an alias that he used. I mean, he had definitely more than one alias that he used throughout his life. But point number one against Frank Dryman being the Zodiac Killer, he was incarcerated at, in Deer Lodge Prison at the time of the Lake Herman Road murders. So then you have to accept that that's not genuine Zodiac activity. I mean, can you place him in the Bay Area at the time? I mean, yes, in the state of California, sure. But he is also somebody who then just flees the state and then takes up you know, a new career in Arizona at the time, well, then what was the point of the Zodiac Killer mystery? And also, you have to remember about Frank Dryman is, he's a thug. He's a dolt. He's a jerk. He's some guy who murdered Clarence Pellet in 1951 because he was talking too much during a hitchhiking uh, car ride. The guy, he was pissing him off because he was a chatterbox type, so he murdered him. He doesn't really ha express the type of cold, methodical, and calculating presence that the Zodiac Killer had. Instead, he is an impulsive, self-serving, self-minded, selfish jerk. But um, not only did uh, he spend uh, years in, pri in Deer Lodge Prison for the murder of Clarence Pellet, Frank Dryman Valentine also went back to Deer Lodge Prison. Clint Pellet, the grandson of Clarence, was part of the team that caught Frank Dryman living in Arizona at the time, working at, like, what was it, a wedding chapel, right? And he was the longest absconding fugitive in Montana state history. The piece of trivia about Donald Lee Booyak is that he was part of the largest manhunt in Montana state history after the murder of Otto Fawson in 1957. Very similar, very similar in that they were criminal thugs, not some type of cold, methodical, and calculating mastermind who's going to compose intricate ciphers. They're impulsive jerks who just did nasty things because they thought that they wouldn't get caught. Oh, no, the pressure's on me. Well, I'm going to shoot a police officer like Otto Fossen, or I'm going to shoot someone who's trying to help me because I can get away with it. And they also say about Frank Dryman, and I heard all this from uh, the presentation that uh, Clem Pellet did to the Montana Historical Society. He said that after Frank Dryman shot Clarence Pellet and unloaded his gun into him, it was a, it was snowing outside. So then he just grabbed the barrel of the cold, the, of the barrel of the gun because it felt cold outside. And he's like, uh, it's cold. I got to warm my hands. 
and then he got back in Clarence Pellet's car and drove off. I mean, I, t I think that Frank Dryman is a very weak suspect. And the last comment that I would like to leave you with is one from Tyler Grover about the satanic cults that run through America, like Maury Terry's The Ultimate Evil, because I talked about a Zodiac Killer suspect named Bill Menser last week, and Bill Menser is someone that Maury Terry heavily thought was in the Process Church. And Tyler Grover wrote, I think the only person who still believes in the satanic cults is your buddy Thomas Henry Horan. And my response was, in the Zodiac case perhaps, but after Pizzagate and Jeffrey Epstein made the national news, a lot of people began sharing this type of info online. Even then, I was surprised that they immediately jumped from cheese pizza to the occult and satanic connections. However, I do agree that, um, well, the stuff we were talking about with Bill Menser, the Cotton Club murder is a window into the criminal underworld, black markets, and how Hollywood can serve as the front for a, the drug trade. Uh, to provide some context, Bill Menser was involved in the Cotton Club murder of 1983. The producer of the movie The Cotton Club, Roy Radin, was shot by Bill Menser and Alex Marty. I think they shot him 13 times, and they put an explosive in his mouth because one of the other... Um, contributing producers, I guess we can call her that, named Lainey Greenberger, felt that she got cheated out of the deal, so she had Menser and Marty commit that crime. But my, my even question in the episode that I did was, why is everybody jumping to this satanic cult angle? Is it not outrageous enough of a story to draw people's attention that Hollywood is serving as the front for the drug trade? Because Lainey Greenberger was all about cocaine smuggling and such that's what the cotton club movie well that's why it was made it was a front for million dollar cocaine deals is that not a big enough story why do you have to add on all these silly layers about these satanic cults which probably aren't really operating and the only thing that i could think of to uh reconcile all of that was that the mainstream media probably doesn't want to talk about that because the movies and the TV are pretty much connected, right? They're different forms of media. They both come from the same studios. And um, maybe the newspapers wouldn't want to touch that either because the thing that I was actually thinking about was perhaps they're just going to bring a story like that out that blaming satanic groups because people are afraid if they actually confront and expose very powerful people like drug lords, they're going to be murdered the way that Roy Radin was. Granted, that was over money, not over exposure. But I think you can get the idea. So they start blaming these satanic groups, which probably don't even exist, to be honest. Or if they do exist, they're just monikers. They're just pseudonyms that, that have been attributed to other destructive actions. Because with the Cotton Club murder, not only do we have Hollywood serving as a front for the drug trade, specifically cocaine trafficking, but also it shows about how there are hierarchies within the criminal underworld, how this person is directing this person, and then that person is directing the contract killers like Bill Menser and Alex Marty. And then Robert Lowe may have been the other accomplice involved with that. I mean, that's your outrageous story. The criminal underworld has been exposed. Hollywood is making movies to entertain you, right? Wrong. They just needed something to, for drug lords to hide their millions of dollars. What a great way to end the show, right? Well, thank you for listening to this all the same. And just a reminder one more time, you can get the free downloads. You can follow the show on Facebook, as well as writing the show at Blackbox Online Radio at AOL.com. Thank you so much. If you listen to the entire thing, you are awesome. And you can always follow the show on Instagram, BlackBoxNid88. And I will see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.